Can you bring back the dead? When Jerry Garcia died eight years ago, most people thought his band, The Grateful Dead, died with him. But the surviving members are back, back on tour. It would seem the odds of recapturing the old magic are against them, but they have defied conventional wisdom for decades. When they started, nobody ever thought they would become the most successful touring band in history. They were always ahead of their time in ways they didn't even know. To help us understand how, they took us back to where it all began, the Haight-Ashbury section of San Francisco. For the people on the street, it was the ultimate flashback. Now, you remember these guys? I recognized who they were, and I had to do a double take. You may not recognize these 50 and 60 year olds, but their fans sure do. There's bass guitarist Phil Lesh, drummers Mickey Hart and Bill Kurtzman, and rhythm guitarist Bob Weir. How does it feel to be back? It's been a long, strange trip, as they say, and you know, coming back this way is like a love lost and found again for me. I thought, Wow, it really is still alive. And we all, we missed it. We missed it like crazy. You can say to the world, the dead are back. Let's go to work. Batter up. The fans are coming to see the dead for the same reason they always did. Their trademark is jamming or improvisation. No song is ever played quite the same way twice. It's what makes the band so unique. We asked them to show us how they improvise. Whoever comes here tonight uh, is not gonna hear what they heard the last time you performed. Tell me how this improvisation thing starts. That's our little secret, Charles. That's what I wanna know, though. They say improvisation is like a conversation with each band member talking to each other musically. How about this one? Bob Weir spoke first. And like any conversation, there are ups and downs. What would be argumentative? What would be... Well, if I add another note, it's not in the scale, so... Ah. Ah. What does that mean? That means we Going could go place. to here. So he poses a question. Do we go there or do we not go there? And then if yeah. one other person goes there, then there's this quantumness. Quantumness? Yes, these old hippies still talk that way. But by improvising, the dead are continually risking total success or total failure. And the fans love them for it. They're called deadheads, and now there are three generations of them. Some fans see the band more often than they should. How many concerts have you been to? I've been to 17, my friend. Four or five on this show, on this tour. Probably my eighth. 10 shows. 20, 30. Probably 52nd ever. Will you see more concerts this summer? We might. Because each show is different and unique, their fans tend to go to as many concerts as they can. That translates into repeat customers and increased ticket sales. It wasn't planned that way, but it's a blueprint for success, now followed by a whole new generation of so-called jam bands. Do you ever think about the fact that, that, that the Grateful Dead have had an impact on other bands who've tried to follow? Fish, Dave Matthews, others. I'm real happy to see it happen to me because these guys are making music that's, you know, a bit more real, shall we say, than, you know, your packaged stuff that was so popular for so long. If you were anything, it was not packaged. That's true, but you see, the thing was, we could <laughs> not never predictable. remember, we never remembered what we did the next day. So you if somebody said duplicate yeah, it, and we let's, could do never it duplicate let's do it today what we did last night, you would say, huh? Creating a money-making machine was never the band's intention. In fact, selling albums was a secondary priority at best. The Grateful Dead didn't even have a top 10 single until they made this video. Some 25 years into their career, it was called A Touch of Grey. To 
song reached number nine in September of 1987. But in typical dead fashion, they refused to capitalize on their commercial success. You had a hit, Touch of Grey. Mm -hmm. It was on the billboard list, yeah. right? You wouldn't even play it at some of your concerts. Well, we played it about every three nights. It was in rotation, but... <laughs> it was in rotation. You but, know. I mean, this is your hit. Yeah, but the thing I is... I mean, your audience wants to hear your hit. If but, we hammered that puppy to death, we wouldn't, it, it wouldn't have any life. I mean, you know, thing, it, it, it wasn't improvisational. It was a song. Yeah. And the songs, they just, they come and go. Just about everything they did defied conventional wisdom. Instead of record sales, they focused on touring. And in the early days, they played for free as often as they did for a paycheck. And in that same spirit, they helped their fans steal their music. Not only did the band let their fans tape their concerts, they even gave them their own section to stand in. When the idea of taping shows appeared, what'd you think? Jerry put it the uh, put it the best as he frequently did. He said, "Let them have it. When we're when we finish when we play it, we're done with it." Jerry thought the music should be free anyway. What seemed like commercial suicide actually turned in their favor. Taping increased fan devotion and also helped spread the word about the band, bringing even more people to the next concert. Nobody can say, I had the idea that if we let them in that a tape, we'll create no. this great audience. <laughs> no way. That was and not... in the end, they will look back at us as entrepreneurial geniuses. Not, not so. <laughs> not so. You lucked out. We yeah. lucked out. They were taping and Grateful Dead is all about luck. The kind of luck that made them the most profitable touring band in rock and roll history, grossing more than 50 million a year, it's a story about how to succeed in business without even trying. So when I say the Grateful Dead business plan, <laughs> we laugh. <laughs> it's not possible for the Grateful Dead to have a business plan. You say that. We don't even plan the music. You say that hundreds of millions of dollars later. Everything we've, everything we've earned and everything we've done, we sort of backed into it. The best stuff we backed in. Yeah. The stuff that we planned the hardest usually turned out the worst. Turned out to be the, yeah. You know, the, the business deals, oh yeah, this one's gonna get it, this one. Let's say it was a merchandising oh, thing. Oh, let's, oh, let's, was, let's make our own record company. Oh, that's oh, a good, there's oh, a good, oh, that's yeah. a good <laughs> Any of you newcomers out there, don't do that. The irony is that the dead's greatest legacy in a time where record sales are plumbing and fans are downloading music for free, may be the business model they accidentally created. A model that focuses on the music and the fans, not the profits. And they're still improving on it. Concert, today is concert. This year, fans can order a CD of the very show they're attending. And the band believes the music industry should follow their example to embrace new technology instead of running away from it. The band has always been optimistic and idealistic, but their beliefs were severely tested when Jerry Garcia died in 1995. This morning, Jerry Garcia, our friend, my brother, passed away. <clears throat> he was 53 years old. He had been battling diabetes, heart problems, and a 20-year heroin addiction. The idea that he died so young, as brothers, did you want to say to him? We tried. We tried desperately a few times. We tried. I mean, we tried. We tried, and it was, it's, the, it's the, one of the biggest tragedies or the, big, the biggest bring downs of my whole life to know that he loved the drug more than he loved us. I love the drug more than I love giving it up. I love the drug more than I love music. See, that's, I find that hard to imagine. I did too. Yeah. I did too, but there it was staring us in the face. Because you could see it in front of you. Yeah. You I'm knew. Sorry to say yes. We knew. That one day you would get a call. Sooner rather than later. Yeah. Jerry's gone. I felt like I had mourned him already when I got the call. 
I had been mourning him for years because he'd been gone for years. Missing in action. What a waste. Twenty thousand fans mourned him at Golden Gate Park. The four surviving members vowed never to play again as the Grateful Dead. How did you find your way back? How did you mystery. end up? It's a mystery. We got in a room, basically. Someone got us in a room together, and we talked for hours, and then... I don't think any of us was really thinking about getting together and playing again. No, we just wanted to see if we, we could be want, brothers again. We just wanted could to be Could we be in the same room? Yeah. You know, do we love each other enough to even... Then it's the thought as we were talking, man, wow, maybe we could play again. Sunshine daydream. Because they promised not to play as a Grateful Dead, they're simply calling themselves the dead. The fans are just happy they're back. And that's why the band took us back to Haight-Ashbury to pay tribute to Jerry Garcia and the spirit of the times that made it all possible. That's right there. It didn't look that fancy then. They took us to the house they shared during the summer of love, a time when money didn't matter and music was everything. We thought about that as they surprised us with one last song. Prison babe, sheriff's on my trail. If he catches up with me, well, I'll spend my life in jail. 